Hello, and welcome to the BewareCast. In this video, we'll begin taking a look at every species to appear in Dougal Dixon's 1981 speculative zoology book, After Man. We'll go through them all in alphabetical order, in this video going from A to F. But before we get started, I'd like to ask that you please hit the like button, as it helps with getting this video recommended to people. And if you end up enjoying this video, then please hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of future uploads. Thank you. We'll start with the Anchor Whip, an extremely long, thin, arboreal treetop canopy-dwelling colubrid snake from Africa, similar to the boom slang. It is among the several tree-living species of the African tropical forest, and is perhaps the most specialised. Its broad, grasping tail, the most muscular part of its body, is used to anchor it to a tree while it lies coiled and camouflaged among the leaves of the tallest crowns, in wait of an unwary passing bird. The snake is capable of darting out three metres, equivalent to about four-fifths of its body length, and seizing its prey while still retaining a tight hold on the branch with its tail. The Angler Heron an Ardine heron from the temperate wetlands of North America descended from the green heron. Fishing skills have been developed to a high degree by the angler heron. This bird creates shallow ponds at the water's edge, in the shade of overhanging trees, by scraping at the river bottom and constructing shallow dams. On the shore nearby, it accumulates a heap of droppings and fish remains to attract beetles and flies. These it then picks up and drops into the shallow water to entice the fish into its pond, where they are easily caught. The Bardalot, a large migratory tundra-dwelling predator rat from the northern hemisphere tundra. It is the only real enemy of the woolly gigantelope, and is a creature that would have been very much at home back in the first half of the last glacial period. With the advent of the Gigantelopes, the saber-tooth pattern in predatory mammals has reappeared, but this time among the predator rats. The Bardalot, unlike other members of the group, exhibits sexual dimorphism, in that only the female is equipped with saber teeth, as well as a bony pouch for them, and hunts woolly Gigantelopes. The male, having none, resembles more the polar bears that once inhabited this altitude, and hunts the seal-like Pytheron rats. Bardalots are about 8 feet long and 3 and a quarter feet high at the shoulders. Males have a mass of about 499 kilograms, females about 390 kilograms. The Beaver now a newly evolved postomic form from coniferous forests in Europe, Asia, and North America, similar in shape to pinnipeds. One large rodent that became adapted to a semi-aquatic way of life during the Miocene, partly as a defence against predators, was the beaver. After humans went extinct, the beaver became even better adapted to life in the water. Its tail and hind feet have become fused together into one large paddle, which, when powered by its backbone, produces a powerful up-and-down swimming stroke. Its ears, eyes, and nose are placed high up on its head, and remain above water when the rest of the animal is submerged. Surprisingly, the paddle does not impair the creature's movement on land, and is used as a grasping limb, enabling it to climb partway up trees, increasing its potential supply of food and building materials. The Booty Bird A large, tundra-dwelling, long-necked corvid from the northern continent descended from the carrion crow. It is the largest avian enemy of the Meeching. It has a long neck and bill and long legs, and in this respect looks rather like a heron. Indeed, in summer, it even behaves like a heron, wading into shallow pools and streams to dip for fish. In the winter, it develops insulating feathers along its legs to protect them from the cold, and becomes a land predator, hunting any smaller animals that are active at the time. It probes for meachings through the snow. The Broadbeak, one of the larger predatory birds found in conifer forests in general, having a wingspan of over a metre. It is descended from the starlings, which expanded to fill the gap left when many of the ancient predatory birds became extinct during the reign of humanity. 
It has a rounded tail and broad, blunt wings, which enable it to fly swiftly and manoeuvre in the tight spaces between the trees. It has a straight, powerful bill and strong talons, which it uses to grip its prey. The Chirrut a herbivorous, tree-dwelling, long-bodied squirrel from the temperate woodlands of Eurasia. Plant-eating mammals abound in the trees of the deciduous forests, eating shoots and leaf buds in the spring and fruits, including nuts, in the autumn. The chirrut is a typical plant-eating mammal. Its particular shape is a legacy from an immediate ancestor, the chiselhead of the northern coniferous forests. As it spread south into the temperate woodlands, it found that it no longer needed to make deep tunnels in the trees to escape the harsh winter, and as a result, the animal's specialised chiselling and gnawing teeth became smaller, its dentition reverting to be more like that of its distant ancestor, the eastern grey squirrel. Its bodily shape, however, was still perfectly adapted to life in the trees, and remained unchanged. Now that the animal no longer led a burrowing existence, its legs and feet had to evolve to suit its new environment. Its hind feet, although small and short, became very powerful and developed strong, gripping claws. The underside of its short tail grew hard and scaly, and with its hind feet formed a strong three-point anchor that could secure the animal to the tree while it reached out to collect food. As its ancestor's jumping ability has completely disappeared, the animal can only move from one tree to another by reaching out and grasping an extended branch. For this reason, the chirrut is found most often in dense thickets, where the trees are close together. Its only enemies are birds of prey, and it is really only vulnerable to these when feeding in the topmost branches. It retains the predilection of the burrowing squirrel for making nests in holes in trees, and often occupies holes and hollows excavated by wood-boring birds. The Chisel Head A Eurasian conifer forest-dwelling squirrel descended from the eastern grey squirrel. Throughout the Cenozoic era, the rodents were one of the most successful animal groups in the coniferous forests. Their powerful teeth enabled them to cope with the tough vegetable matter found there, and their warm, furry coats helped them to retain body heat during hibernation. The Chiselhead, a rodent and a relation of the temperate woodland Chirrits, is highly adapted to life in the coniferous forest. Its huge incisor teeth and worm-like body enable it to burrow deep into the living wood, where it can remain protected from the cold in the wintertime. Although in some ways the animal is at an advanced stage of development, its parasitic way of life is really quite primitive. Its staple diet is the bark of trees, which it strips off completely, leaving the tree totally denuded. This, combined with the massive damage it does by burrowing, kills the tree within a few years. As the chisel heads only colonise live trees, they must be continually on the move, and every spring, after hibernation, the young of the new generation migrate to find new territories. During migration, they are very vulnerable, and many are taken by predators before they can complete the journey. This balance between chisel head and predator is highly critical, and it needs only a slight reduction in the number of predators to produce an increase in the population of chisel heads that would lead to the total destruction of vast areas of coniferous forest. No other small rodent found in the coniferous forest is quite so destructive. The Chukaboo, an energetic, monkey-like possum from the Australian rainforest. As in previous ages, the Australian marsupials of the Postomic have developed forms that are superficially very similar to those of placental mammals, existing in similar environments in other parts of the world. A prime example of this is the Chukaboo, essentially a marsupial monkey with grasping four legs, opposable digits, and a prehensile tail. Its bodily form, similar to many of the true monkeys in Africa and Asia at this time, is well suited to life in the trees. The Clatter A grey herbivorous lemur sloth-like loris from the tropical forests of Asia. 
It is a prosimian with a heavily armoured tail protected by a series of overlapping horny plates demonstrating the principle of tree-dwelling primates that developed new physical attributes to protect themselves from strigers. Before the arrival of the advanced tree-living predators, such a tail would have been a disadvantage, interfering with the efficiency of food gathering. Any tendency for such a cumbersome structure to evolve would have been quashed rapidly by natural selection. But faced with constant danger, the efficiency of food gathering would have taken on an importance secondary to defence, and would have therefore created the correct conditions for it to evolve. The animal itself is a leaf eater and moves slowly upside down along the boughs. When a striger attacks, it drops down and hangs from a branch by its tail. The clatter is now safe, the only part within reach of the predator is too heavily armoured to be vulnerable. The Cleft Back Antelope a redundancine bovid from the tropical grasslands of Lemuria that is superficially similar to an ancestral antelope. It has a curious symbiotic relationship with the tick bird. This relationship is really no more than a strengthening of the symbiosis that had developed between small birds and large grazing mammals during the early part of the Cenozoic. Birds on the grassy plains often accompanied the large mammals, catching the insects disturbed by their hooves, or pecking ticks and mites from the hides of the big mammals themselves. The grazing mammals tolerated this as the little birds ridded them of parasites and also gave warning of approaching danger. In the case of the cleft back antelope, the relationship has become more intimate and the animal's back has ceased to be a mere perch and has become a nesting site. Along the animal's back is a pair of ridges supported by outgrowths from the vertebrae. Between the ridges is a deep cleft lined by stiff hairs that provide an ideal nesting medium for the tick bird. Several families may nest on its back at any one time. Superficial warts on the animal's flanks produce pus at certain times of the year. The pus attracts flies, which lay eggs in the warts. The flies' maggots appear just as the young birds are hatching and provide them with a ready-made source of food. In return, the antelope is supplied by both a constant grooming service and an early warning system that alerts it to approaching predators. The Common Pine Chuck A finch from the coniferous forests of Eurasia with great sexual dimorphism in which the male and female look like two completely different species. It is descended from the European green finch, which was a bird similar in physical appearance to the present day female, and the male has evolved his own distinctive features, primarily for display, and his eating habits are a secondary development. Of the many seed-eating birds found in the coniferous forests, the largest is by far the common pine chuck. The two sexes of this species are quite different, both in appearance and in their mode of life. The male is much more powerfully built and is equipped with a massive beak which he uses for breaking open pine cones to feed on the seeds. The female, much smaller and drabber, totally lacks the male's heavy beak and is really a scavenger supplementing her diet with carrion, grubs, adult insects and other birds' eggs. The Desert Leaper a large kangaroo-like gerbil from the deserts of Asia and Africa with the lifestyle of a dromedary camel. The extinction of the dromedary camel is at about the same time as humanity died out, and left a niche that was distinctly unattractive to any other animal. For a large animal to exist in desert conditions, a quite remarkable physiology is required. The dromedary camel, for instance, was able to lose about 30% of its body weight through dehydration without ill effects, and it stored all the subcutaneous fat of its body in one lump, leaving the rest of the body free to radiate heat. It could tolerate fluctuations in its body temperature to some extent, and had thick nostril covers and eyelids that effectively kept dust and sand out of its nose and eyes. After some 50 million years of evolution, these features have all developed again in one postomic animal, the Desert Leaper. The Leaper is descended from the Sand Rat and has grown large. Adult males may reach more than 3 meters from nose to tail. The tail is the most unusual feature of this animal. 
It is here that all its subcutaneous fat is stored. The fat is not a water store, but a store of food that enables the leaper to go for long periods without eating when food is unavailable. When the fat store is full, the animal's body is well balanced as it can leap quickly along on its hind limbs. In this condition, it can undertake journeys of 100 kilometers or more between waterholes and oases. It has broad, horny pads on the toes of its hind feet, which prevent it from sinking into the sand and give it a good grip on naked rock. The Desert Shark, a large, predatory, naked, mole-rat-like, white-toothed shrew from the deserts of Asia. It is sausage-shaped, with a blunt, strong head and powerful, shovel-like paws. It swims through the sand rather than burrowing, bursting into rodents' nesting chambers, such as sand flapjacks, which it locates using the sensory pits at the end of its nose. It is almost completely hairless, and avoids the extremes of temperature by remaining underground for most of the time. When it is at rest, it lies just below the surface, with only its eyes and nostrils protruding. The Desert Spickle a small, long-snouted geomyoid from the deserts of North America. Among the thorns found in the vertical grooves of cactus stems lives the desert spickle, its narrow body covered by spines that are partly for defence and partly for camouflage among the cactus thorns. It has no teeth and subsists entirely on the nectar of cactus flowers, which it drinks through its long snout. When collecting nectar, it often picks up pollen on its head, the pollen is eventually deposited on the stigmas of other flowers, thus affecting the cross-pollination of the cacti. Living almost solely on nectar, the spickle's digestive system is a very primitive affair, since nectar is very easily broken down. Predators of the spickle include long-legged quails, the distarterops, a large semi-aquatic relative of the predator rats from the polar ocean that looks like a cross between a beaver and a walrus. Among the organic detritus on shallower areas of the ocean bed of the polar ocean are found banks of shellfish. Living on these shellfish is the distarterops, by far the most massive swimming relative of the predator rats. It reaches a length of about 4 meters and has an insulating coat of matted hair made up of a mosaic of solid plates, giving it a lumpy, rather than streamlined appearance. Its most unusual feature is its teeth. The upper incisors form long, pointed tusks. In males, the left-hand one projects forward, whereas the right-hand one points straight down, and is used as a pick for removing bivalves from the sea bottom. This asymmetry is also found in the limbs. The left forelimb only is equipped with a strong claw, which it uses to dislodge particularly stubborn shells. The Fat Snake, a large elipid from the undergrowth of the Australian tropical forests. Convergent evolution on the Australian subcontinent is not solely characteristic of the marsupials. The Fat Snake has adopted many of the characteristics of forest ground-dwelling vipers, such as the Gaboon Viper and Puff Adder, of the long-lived genus Bytis that are found in other parts of the northern continent. These include a fat, slow-moving body and a coloration that renders it totally invisible in the leaf litter of the forest floor. The fat snake's neck is very long and slender and allows its head almost to forage independently of its body. Its main method of catching prey is to deal it a poisonous bite from where it lies hidden. Only later, when its venom has finally killed it and begun its digestive function, does the fat snake finally catch up with it and eat it. The Fin Lizard A small bipedal Iguanian lizard with no front limbs from North American deserts. Lizards and other reptiles do not have the sophisticated mechanisms that mammals and birds have for regulating body temperature. Their temperature is entirely dependent on the surroundings. Several desert reptiles in the postomic have, however, developed rudimentary devices for keeping themselves cool. The fin lizard, for instance, has a system of erectile fins and dewlaps on its neck and tail, which it raises into the wind when its body becomes too hot. The heat is transferred through the fins via the bloodstream into the air. When cooling off, 
This lizard typically balances on one leg while keeping the other off the hot desert surface to get maximum benefit from the system. Predators of the fin lizard include long-legged quails. The flightless orc. A flightless semi-aquatic penguin great orc like Alcyne orc from the polar ocean. In winter, the polar ocean is largely barren. In spring, however, the sunlight produces a bloom of unicellular algae near the surface, which provides food for the microscopic animal life that forms the basis of the oceanic food chain. In spring, shoals of pelagic fish come northwards through the Northern Ireland barrier to feed on the zooplankton, bringing with them countless numbers of seabirds. The first bird species to arrive is the flightless orc, a totally aquatic creature with paddle-like wings. In this respect, they resemble the penguins, which were so successful in the Southern Hemisphere in earlier times. Apart from during the winter, the flightless orcs rarely come ashore or climb onto the ice, where they are quite defenceless. Pregnant females retain their eggs until they are almost ready to hatch and lay them in the open water. The flightless orcs first evolved at the northernmost tip of the northern continent and, as they became established, spread both east and west, forming a chain of subspecies in a ring around the polar ocean. Throughout most of the ring, each subspecies is able to breed with the neighbouring ones, but where the ends of the chain overlap, the differences are so great that no interbreeding is possible, and these populations must be regarded as separate species. Flightless orcs are often preyed on by pythorons. The flightless guinea fowl. A large, flightless, wingless guinea fowl from the tropical grasslands of Africa descended from the helmeted guinea fowl. Standing about 1.7 meters high, it sports a startling selection of erectile wattles and inflatable throat pouches, which are used in threat displays when dominance or pecking order is threatened. It is an omnivorous bird and feeds on seeds, grasses, insects and small reptiles. Although it can deal a lethal blow with its broad feet, in common with most plains-dwelling animals, it runs off when real danger threatens. Mating occurs in the early summer and normally results in one or two eggs being laid five or six weeks later. The incubation is shared by both males and females. The flightless shaloth. An omnivorous, flightless, arboreal, primate, sloth-like vesper bat from the tropical forests of Batavia, which spends its life hanging upside down like the ancient three-toed sloth. It eats leaves and the occasional insect or smaller vertebrate, such as a rodent, caught by a swift jab of its single claw. The fluer. A strange, flightless, largely sedentary leaf-nosed bat from the tropical forests of Batavia, its brightly coloured ears and nose flaps mimic a species of flower found on the islands. It sits among them with its face turned upwards, snapping at any insect that attempts to land. Although it has arisen independently, the fluor's feeding mode is remarkably similar to that of the flower-faced potu of South America and is an interesting instance of convergent evolution. The flower-faced potu a diurnal potu from the tropical grasslands of South America. It is the oddest bird found on the South American grasslands. The interior of its beak is coloured and patterned like the petals of a flower, so that when it has its mouth open, it looks exactly like an open bloom. This elaborate mimicry is designed to deceive insects and provides the potu with a meal by merely opening its mouth. Because tropical grassland flowers appear only when there is adequate moisture, the potu migrates seasonally with the rains. The flunky, a very small marmoset-like old world monkey descended from the vervet monkey from the treetop canopies of the tropical forests in Africa. It has become adapted to a gliding mode of locomotion. In this development, it parallels the evolution of many other mammals that have evolved gliding webs of skin, or patagia, from folds of skin between the limbs and tail. To support the patagia and deal with the stresses involved in flight, the backbone and the limb bones have become remarkably strong for an animal of its size. Steered by its rudder-like tail, the flunky makes great gliding leaps between the crowns of the highest trees to feed on fruit and termites.
Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video then please hit the like button and subscribe to be notified of future uploads. Also, please don't forget to leave a comment and share this video with anyone who you feel would enjoy it. I'd also like to thank my generous patrons and channel members who can be seen here. This has been the Beware Cast, and I'll catch you in part two. Take care.